Praise the Lord, everybody. My name is Sean Henry Scott Sr. I go by the position of an apostle in the body of Jesus Christ. Today is 6-14-2017, and we are blessed. If you're hearing, singing, living, moving, you are blessed because you are alive. You have another day. You have another opportunity. You have another chance. There's not a time, second, or day that goes by where someone has passed on as my bishop used to say, from their labors to their rewards. Because we will all one day be rewarded <clears throat> for the things that we have done in our body while we were living. And as the Bible makes it clear that, and we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that there's no working in the grave. So once our time is up here on earth, that's it. Ain't nothing else you can do. Today is our midweek miracle service and we'll be speaking on a subject entitled, Who Wants to be Saved? Who? Who wants to be saved? And as we always do, we begin with a word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank and praise you for yet another opportunity to be in the land of the living, Lord Jesus. If I was to go on the internet right now, I know I can search who died, and it would show me somebody somewhere in the earth who passed away from yesterday to today, Father God. We thank and praise you that we have another opportunity, Father God, to lift up your name, Father God, to do what you created us to do, to live in this life, Father God, in the land of the living. We thank and praise you, Father God, in the name of Jesus. Although everything is not completely perfect in our lives, Father God, that we would want to be perfect, we just thank and praise you for the opportunity and the chance, Father God, to be perfected. Be perfected by your word, Father God, to draw closer to you. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I, I hear the scripture saying into my spirit that, 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 that we're renewed day by day, Father God. Our mercies and grace, Father God, we're given chances to do the things that we wasn't able to do. I pray in the name of Jesus, Father God, for those that are sick and shut in, Father God, those that are not in their natural mind. I pray, Father God, in the name of Jesus, the word will set them free, Father God, from that bondage in the name of Jesus. We thank you for this platform of Ustream.tv, YouTube by Playback, and Facebook Live, Father God. I pray in the name of Jesus that your word will not return to you void, Father God. We realize and recognize that it serves a purpose. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray, hallelujah and amen. Again, my name is Sean Henry Scott Sr. Go by the position of an apostle of the body of Jesus Christ. Our ministry is TeamJesusUSA.com. That's www.teamjesususa.com. You can contact us if you need to. Also, by way of phone at 614-847-2057 or 614-723-9770. Now that we have got that out the way, let us get into the word and what we're here for today. Um... We're talking about who wants to be saved and um, the topic saved. We're talking about being saved. I'm going to do this in the Q&A format, mainly. I'm going to ask some questions and with the scriptures I'm going to answer the questions. Because if you was to ask the question, who wants to be saved, everybody would say, I do. There's very few people who out of their natural mind who would say, no, I don't want to be saved. I want to, I want to be caught up in the wrath of God to where I'm not going to be saved. So. If we was to ask the question or oral to in front of a church and you know we've all been trained to answer correctly, politically correctly or biblically correctly, PC or BC, who wants to be saved? Everybody say, I want to be saved, but you could tell by the choices that people make in their lives who they served. You know, you know, we say a lot of stuff with our mouths, but our actions say something totally different. We know according to the scripture that <clears throat> faith without works is dead, meaning that if you say you believe in something, but you're not willing to do it, and you have no faith in it, then that's a dead subject to you. You're just lying. So save means to keep safe or rescue someone or something from harm or danger. That's the simple de definition of save, to keep safe or to rescue some something or someone from harm or danger. Got the fan on. I don't like air. So I'm trying to stay dry. So we're going to do today's sermon like a Q&A. Like I said, we're going to answer frequently asked questions concerning salvation. I believe it's very important that each and every church, every ministry, especially online, uh, to talk about salvation every once in a while. You know, you, you can turn on preaching TV and you can go to the internet and People are talking about every subject underneath the sun. But what we need to do, I believe, as believers and preachers and ministers, is every once in a while, we need to talk about salvation. Because that's what it's all about. 
if, if people are not saved, what are we talking about? If people are not uh, are trying to live a saved life, what are we talking about? You know, even a, a paramedic or any, uh, when they come uh, to an accident or they go into an emergency, their whole objective is to save the individual. They're not going there just because there's a fire or because there's a car accident or because something has happened. They're going there with the intent of saving the individuals. Or otherwise, why would they show up? Like the firemen. The firemen, when people dial 911, what is your emergency? People are coming with the intent to save the, the people who are in danger. Same way with the police officers. The police officers are coming with the intent of putting their lives on the line to save whoever dialed 911 who, is the, who are in trouble. So as a church, I'm talking about the people, not the building. As the, uh, the people of God who understand salvation and the need for salvation, I believe it's very important that we make it clear that God has left us here. We are still here to help save people, to help reconcile mankind to God. And, and it's so easy as we grow and mature in this life to get caught up in anything and everything else. But it's important that as we are doing our jobs, our careers, uh, reaching goals in our lives, you know, whatever the goals may be, financially, physically, um, emotionally, whatever, get married, whatever the goals may be, that you stay, that you're saved. Because if you're not saved and the wrath of God comes, everything was for nothing. What good does it do for a person to spend their whole life being physically fit and work out and have their body in top physical condition just to jump off a bridge and commit suicide with that same body. It was all in vain. It was all a waste of time. And that's how it could be for a person who tries to, to, to live for Jesus Christ their whole life and then before they pass on, they just do some crazy stuff and denounce their faith. And, and what was it all for? It's all in vain. Same way it is if, if we strive our whole life to live this life for Christ. And then at the end, we started acting crazy. And then we stand before Jesus Christ, the righteous judge one day. And he said, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I know you not. It was all in vain. You know, you hear these things happening. You know, what happened? Oh, well, this happened, happened. So that's why I'm so excited and so glad that I don't have anything to do with the final judgment of people's eternal damnation or eternal life. Because eternal life, whether you believe it or not, is a long time. And you say, well, my body's going to die. You're right, your body is going to be in the grave. But... Your conscious man, your soul, is going to go on to live, according to the Bible, even in eternal damnation or eternal life with, with the rest of us in, in heaven with Jesus Christ. So nothing down here is worth your eternal salvation, your eternal life. Nothing. Not one single thing down here is worth your eternal salvation. So we're going to speak on being saved today. Who wants to be saved? And we're going to speak on being saved and... um. We're going to do it, like I said, the Q&A format, question and answers format, of uh, frequently asked questions that I've received from time to time. So the first question that we have is why we need to be saved. Why we need to be saved. And we, I'm going to answer that. There's a lot of ways I could have answered it, but I tried to do this stuff according to what the Spirit of the Living God was giving me. And we find ourselves in Romans chapter 5, we're going to read verses 9 through 21 to answer that question. Why we need to be saved. Why? You know, I'm a person, I'm not got friends who say think they're good people, you know, they, they pay their taxes, they do what they're supposed to do, they don't beat up people, they don't rob, steal, cheat, or kill, they're very courteous to people, they open doors, close doors, yes ma'am, no ma'am, they don't use profanity, drink alcohol, smoke, they don't um, do things that, that they don't believe they should do, they feel like they're good people. So why do I need to be saved? I'm a good person. Well, what do I need saved from? I'm a good person. So, Romans 5, chapter 5, verses 9, if you follow following on the King James Version of the Bible, is what I read from, and we're going to start on, and it says, For this is the word of, the, of promise, at this time I will come. And I am in the wrong place, immediately. I'm in 9-5. I need to go to 5-9. Five, 5-9. Nine. Five, nine. Where are we supposed to be? Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of through him. So very uh, immediately, verse 9 in Romans chapter 5 lets us know that the wrath that's going to come is going to come from God. So there is, that's not ironic. The very very same person that can save you is the same person by which the wrath is going to come from. So it says, much more being justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. Verse 10, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God, 
by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. When they say we were enemies, I mean when we were sinners. You are enemies to God. You are enemies to the cause of God when you are a sinner. Why? Because we're called to be witnesses for him. And if uh, you, you cannot be a legitimate witness for Jesus Christ and God if you're living foul. Because people will see you and think that that's the way you're supposed to be as a Christian. You know, how many people who were around saying, well, they all hypocrites and I ain't going in there because this, that, and the other. That's what he talks about, by being enemies of God. You're an enemy of God when you don't live the life that God has called you to live for him. Because we all know those of us that have children, the kids will do what they see you do and not necessarily what you say. Because they recognize hypocrites too. Verse 11. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our, through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. So we received atonement through Jesus Christ from God. Why do we need atonement? Because we can't atone for our own sins. In other words, I remember a time that uh, someone had used my ID and they had stole my identity and they had went to jail. And I went to go try and bail them out of jail. And the lady was punching me up at the sheriff's office in Columbus, Ohio. And she's like, uh, you can't bail this person out because you're the one in there. So in other words, you can't atone for yourself neither. If you're the one up on the cross dying, how could you atone for yourself? So we needed that somebody else atone for the sins that we committed. And that's what Jesus, God sent Jesus Christ to, through, to, do, to do. Verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered the world, Adam, and death by sin, and so do so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So through Adam's fall in the garden with Eve, sin entered the world so that anybody who's born a natural birth into creation also have that blood iniquity sin in their blood. And so we all have sinned, even a baby, baby sin, not necessarily the sins of omission but commission you know what I'm saying um, in other words a baby can't commit adultery a baby can't commit fornication but because that baby has the blood of a mother and a father and iniquity is in the blood that baby is born a sinner everybody's like well how can, what happens to babies that's between God and the babies 13 for until the law of sin was in the world but sin is not imputed where there is no law 14 nevertheless death reigned from Adam to Moses even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who was the figure of him that was to come. So 14 says, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. And I ask myself this question, what, what happened to Moses when they got to Moses? When the time came, when Moses came, God sent Moses in as a deliverer with the law. So at that particular time, the law was given for man to have a way to, 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 to start trans getting out of sin. Up until then, man had no opportunity to, to get out of the sin. But once, once the law was given, the Torah was given, <laughs> ah, morning routine, get the dirt out from last night. Never left death reign from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who was the figure of him that was to come. The figure of him was to come, speaking about Jesus Christ. 15, in Romans chapter 5, but not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the office of many be dead, much more the grace of God by the, the gift of grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, who have abounded unto many. So the grace of God allowed us to have an opportunity to receive Jesus Christ when he came so that we would not have, a have to live a life full of sin. In other words, before Jesus Christ was offered and given as an atonement, we were all men most miserable because we had no way to release ourselves from a sin-filled life. We had no way. 16. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. 17. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more that they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by of the offense of the judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by righteousness of the one, the free gift came upon all men by justification of life. In a nutshell, when you accept Jesus Christ, well, Adam's sin that caused sin to be in all of creation for everybody because people say well I ain't done wrong every you're born you're a sinner 
But the same way we wasn't to condemnation because God sent Jesus Christ for an opportunity for man to receive a way out. As we all know, the scripture says there's one way and one Lord, one faith, one baptism. There's one. There's only one way to get out of a life, a sinful life, so that you can eventually uh, go on and live with Jesus Christ for eternity. There's only one way. 19. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one, so many will be made righteous. So Adam caused everybody to live a life in disobedience because of his sin nature and when he fell. And Jesus Christ came so that we could be made righteousness in the eyes of God. We can't be made righteousness in and of ourselves because once again we can't atone for ourselves. We can't be faithful because of our sin nature before Jesus Christ. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abound, sin abound, grace did much more abound. Finally, 21, that is sin hath reigned unto death. Even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Now I've just read into your hearing Romans chapter 5, 9 through 21, which answers the question why we need to be saved. We need to be saved because Long, 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 I can't say long enough, long time ago, um, Adam had fell in the Garden with Eve. And when they fell, being the first humans created on this face on the planet, every human after them has sin nature. Because before them, as we know, there was no sin. There was nothing before them. So there was no need, excuse me, there was no need for atonement. But when Adam and Eve fell in sin, so if you also have to tell anybody why we need to be saved, we need to be saved because we are full of sin nature and the only way we can accept justification to righteousness is through Jesus Christ and accepting him as our Lord, our Savior and our Lord. Number two, what do we need to be saved from? What do we need to be saved from? Now, I could, you, this is a question that everybody should be able to answer within their own selves because don't nobody know you like Jesus. And secondly, don't nobody know you like yourself. You know yourself. You know the things that you struggle with, the things you have issues with. The Bible makes it clear that there, there is none righteous. No, not one. No one is righteous. So Matthew one twenty one, we will answer this question. It says, what do we need to be saved from Matthew 1 21 and she shall bring forth a son and thou shalt call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from their sins so the Bible makes it clear in Matthew 1 21 that we need to be saved from sin once again there's that word sin we need to be saved from sin the Bible says in Matthew 1 21 and she shall bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from their sins now, I love the fact that it says that his people, because unfortunately we know as, as much as we want everybody to be saved, or you know, people we love and know, and I, I know some wonderful people, but they don't believe in Jesus Christ. And I do everything I can to try and share my faith with people by way of obviously the internet and um, just a lifestyle that, that, that God called me to live. That's why it's so important when I talk to people that it's important that you make a calling and election sure. The Bible says, and in doing so, you shall never fall. So when you accept your calling, um, people will see you working in the, in the capacity that God has created you to do. And then they will see Jesus through your works. They may see your works and glorify your God, which is in heaven. But when people reject their calling, well, I don't want to be a preacher. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. God has created that calling for you to be that light that he desires for you to shine in this earth so people can see you and glorify God. So when people reject that, they miss out on the very things that God has called you to be and your reason for being down here. So why? Do, what do we need to be saved from? We need to be saved from ourselves. There is no part of your life that you can ever trust yourself. This was kind of hard for me to understand growing up too as I came to understand who Jesus Christ was, is, and is a coming. Is that we can't trust ourselves. We can't trust our emotions. We can't trust our, 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 our memory. We can't trust our wisdom. We can't trust our knowledge. We can't trust nothing in and of ourselves. There's not one thing about ourselves that we can trust. We can't even trust what we think we should eat as a diet because if the Holy Spirit say don't do this and you do it, then your body reacts and you're tripping like, why, why, Lord, why did you allow this to happen? Because God told us, he tells us in his word what we're supposed to do to have the kind of life that he promised us that we can have. 
And this may seem surprising to a lot of people, but God, God promised us 120 years on this earth. And I prayed one time, I said, well, why do people die so young then? God shared with me by revelation and praying that there is two reasons why people die before their time, other than disobedience. Um, lack of rest and stress. Those are the number one and two killers of the body, your temple. Number, lack of rest and stress. People don't rest. In other words, he's given us a rest. People don't take the rest that God has given us. The Sabbath, people don't use that and take that rest and do what they're supposed to do. Because in the Bible says when the people was told to rest, your land, your slaves, your everything was supposed to rest. That's why you'll see Orthodox Jews and some Jews walking on their Sabbath because they don't even want to use their cars. They don't use any devices. Or they walk to their, their synagogues or their, wherever they call them. They walk to those places and they walk back until sundown. They don't do anything because they still believe in that. And also stress. Uh, people stress and stress. Worrying is a sin. The reason why worrying is a sin it's because when you worry about things, that means you're not trusting God. And, that, and that's a hard thing for people because we, we stress over everything. You know, bills. And I tell people all the time when I used to preach in front of a physical audience, I said, you still going to have a bill when you die because somebody's going to pay for that coffin. You know, even if you prepaid for it, there's going to be something that you're gonna, that's going to come in your name that, that they say you owe. So why are you stressing over something that you can't control? And God knew that if you don't put your whole trust in him, that, that you're putting your trust and faith in something else. So those are the two things that kill people. So what we need to be saved from is ourselves. The Bible says there is none righteous. No, not one. So we need to be saved from ourselves. And the scripture says in Matthew 1, 21 again, And she shall bring forth a son, and he shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people. Now, are you his people? Who is his people? His people is... In John 3, 16, whosoever believeth, that's who the people of God are. Because if you believe in Jesus Christ, was, is, and is to come, you are his people. So those are the people he came to save because everybody's not going to be saved. As you know, everybody don't claim Jesus Christ. Everybody don't uh, treat him the way the Bible says we're supposed to treat him with worship and adoration. So the Bible says he will save his people from their sins. In other words, he's saving us from the sins that we committed. He didn't commit any sins according to the Bible. If he had committed sins, he would not have been a the, the, the Passover lamb. He would never been able to be used to atone us for our sins. Because the Passover lamb had to be spotless. We're going to turn over into Acts chapter 2. And we're going to read 36 through 41. Still talking about what do we need to be saved from. What do we need to be saved from. What is it that we need to be saved from. So Acts chapter 2, 36 through 41 says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made the same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. He's both Lord and anointed. 37. <clears throat> now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. 39. For the promise is unto you, to your children, and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. 40. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. 41. Finally, then they that... Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. So there were some that didn't receive it. And that same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So there were some that did not receive the word of God. So what we need to be saved from, question number two, the first question was why we need to be saved. The second question was what do we need to be saved? We need to be saved from ourselves. You know, I'm experiencing a time in my life at the age of 48 where I've never seen so much pride. I'm talking about even within the body of Jesus Christ. There's so much people try to present themselves to be a certain way to other people. And I'm like, how did how and when did you give people the power over you? Because that's really what pride does. Pride makes you feel like you have to be a certain way to, to people, to me. That's the definition of pride to me. It's like I have to present myself a certain way to people. 
That's why I love the scripture where it talked about what Paul said. I did not come to you with el an eloquent of speech. In other words, I don't have to. I don't have to pretend to be some preacher that I'm not to go online and preach. I know a lot of great and awesome preachers who are not preaching. And I asked them often, even once I used to preach with on TV, I said, man, why aren't you doing this online? Why don't you share the gospel online the, the way I do? Man, I ain't going on there, man, blah, 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 blah. And I'm sitting here like, man, you're, you're good. You're, you, you would have probably like a million, zillion followers. Unlike me, I'm just, I'm just, people know me, I'm just brass. I'm kind of like right to the point. <laughs> I'm not trying to put no sugar on it. I just tell people what does say the Lord, you know, you can either receive or reject it. I'm not that dude, but I see in this day and age more than any time other uh, pride. People have a, a, people don't even want people to know when they sick. I don't want people, you know, doing this. What? Praying for you? That's what the Bible says we're supposed to do. But the, the, right, the prayers of the righteous avail of much. I mean, people, pride has, has came up and, and choked people in one way or the other to where they feel like they got to present themselves to be something that they're not. In other words, I don't want nobody to know I need help. And I don't get that. Why not? That, that, if, if you need help, ask for help. If you need some, a couple dollars, ask for a couple dollars. The Bible says you have not because you ask not. Let me share this before I move off this point because I believe it's so important to the point to where I was about to get on the internet and preach the other day. I had somebody tell me one time, well, I don't want people to know that I'm sick because then they're going to be coming around and they're going to be... That's, that's what they're supposed to do. Because <laughs> when you're sick, God has you in a condition where you're humble. And then, you know, there's a time where he's going to exalt you if... And I would go as far as to say that I have known people that who've passed on and it wasn't their time to pass on. But because they wouldn't humble themselves under the mighty hand of God, even going through that thing, they died. And I prayed, I prayed hard. And I felt, I said, God, I, I feel so strong in my spirit that it was not this person's time to go on. And he said it wasn't. But because of pride, because they allowed themselves to be so prideful that they refused to ask and seek for help. They didn't want nobody to know because they, they're, they, 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 they're prayer and people that they go to church. They want people to think, oh, this couldn't dare happen to me. What you mean it couldn't happen to you? Those are the people God used. God used strong people to make them weak, to build them back up, to show people who their strength was in the Lord. So some people have been deceived to where they allow pride to run their lives and dictate their lives. And I don't want to pick on uh, the homosexuals or people who've chosen to live that lifestyle, but that's exactly what pride is. Pride is mean I'm a flamboyant. I'm going to be out the closet. I'm going to show people what I'm going to do and how big and bad I am. Well, guess what? There's going to come a time when there's going to be a judgment and you're going to have to uh, give an answer for the choices that you have made to live in this life. And pride is not going to be the answer that's going to get you into the kingdom of heaven. So it says, uh, then they that gladly received his word were baptized. 40 says, I want to read 40 again in Acts chapter 2. Verse 40, it says, And with many other words did he testify and exhort, say, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. You have to save yourself from a generation uh, of your peers. You remember that word, peer pressure? If, I was, if somebody was to ask me what happened to me from my childhood when I was going to church, my parents was forcing me to go to church. If somebody was to ask me what happened from that time, so when I decided not to go to church no more, it was peer pressure. It was peer pressure. Here I am going to church, and all my friends who didn't go to church out there playing football, and I'm like, man, I wish I could be out there playing. Well, I got to go to church. They ain't going to church. And honestly speaking, I'm glad my mom made me go to church. I'm glad, excuse me, I'm glad my grandmother made me go to church. I'm glad they made me go to church. Because some of those same people that's out there playing football ain't here today. They go, they're, they're passed on. Because they was living a lifestyle that led them to an early destruction. And I didn't understand, even though my mother was making me and my, mom, my grandmother was making me go to church, I didn't understand that that was, in, that was instilling in me some values and some things that would give me a prosperous life. Even now, like the Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go and when he is old, he will not depart from that. Because as I grew older, I experienced some things that other people couldn't handle. I heard of people committing suicide because they went to divorce. I went through three of them, and I'm still here standing. And I'm married today, happily married today to my wife. So what that allowed me to understand is that the things that we experience that's negative in this life, they're not to break us down. They're not to kill, steal, destroy us. They're to build up godly character in us to show people who can't handle those things that look here. If you put your hope, trust, and faith in Jesus, you'll be able to save yourself 
from this untoward generation. In other words, I don't care what they doing in this generation. I'm still going to stand for Jesus Christ. I don't care what's the trend, what's trendy now. I don't care what all the people who act like they got money and fame is doing. I'm going to do what God say do. I don't care because I'm going to save myself from this generation that, that think they don't need Jesus Christ. They're scared to speak and preach his name. They're scared to stand on righteousness. They're scared to live holy. I'm going to save myself from this untoward generation. So number two, the answer would be uh, that we need to say, what do we need to say from? We need to say from ourselves, the man in the mirror. I'm starting with the, we start with the man in the mirror and we save ourselves because the Bible says, examine yourself that you're still in the faith. That, that's how easy it is people can get, get sifted away because the person you see every day in that mirror is the person that could actually be the one that calls you to miss heaven. You don't want to do that. So we save ourselves. Uh, we need to be saved from ourselves. And I want to carry on number two. I had a part two to number two because we also are saved from the wrath of God. Our verse, the very first scripture we read is why we need saved was uh, we need saved because there's going to be a wrath. God is not coming back to hug people and hand out suckers and love on people like he did when he, when he was here the last time. He's not coming for that. He's coming to pronounce judgment on this world. So we need to be saved from the wrath of God is uh, number two and part two. What do we need saved from? Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. Now, we're all going to die. There is no way around that, that fact. That's a known fact that there is going to be a time where we're not going to be here. We are all going to die. So the wages of sin is death. So we're, this body is going to die. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So we can receive the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ, or we can reject Jesus Christ and receive eternal death. Matthew 25, 46, And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The scripture makes it clear beyond any and every shadow of any kind of doubt, there, there is going to be eternal damnation and there's going to be eternal life. So I don't believe in heaven. You ain't got to believe in heaven or hell. When I was preparing this yesterday, God gave me this, this very simple example. You can look at outside and it could be sunny. Birds can be singing. People outside cooking out and the sky is as clear as they can be. And somebody can say, it's going to rain. And, um, man, it ain't going to rain. Look how beautiful it is out here to say. So you got one person that believes it's going to rain, and you got one person that believes it's not going to rain. And all of a sudden, boom, the rain happens. And the rain is coming down, and people are getting wet. So all of a sudden, everybody's getting wet. That's how judgment is going to be. It's going to rain on the just and the unjust. There will be people who say, I don't believe in heaven or hell. You don't have to believe in it, and it's still going to happen. You can't. There's nothing you can do about what's going to happen according to the Word of God. First of all, the Word of God has already proven itself time and time again. There is nothing that anybody on this earth can do to disprove the word of the living God. It's already been proven time and time again. It's being proven even now as I preach the gospel of Jesus Christ that the, the, what's going to happen is going to happen and there ain't nothing nobody can do about it. The Bible says you're going to die, you're going to die. So there ain't nothing you can do to change that. Only thing you can change is make a decision to live for Jesus Christ and go on to your conscious soul can go on to live with Jesus Christ forever and eternity, or you can live in condemnation and damnation in the lake of fire, as the scripture says. So the number two of the two says that we need to be saved from the wrath of God, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So we need to be saved from eternal destruction. And once again, Matthew 25, 46 says, and these shall go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Revelation 20, 15 says, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. When I, when I be doing outside ministry, sometimes I just simply walk up to people and say, can you swim? I say, yeah, I can swim. I say, can you swim in the lake of fire? They're like, no, I can't swim in the lake of fire. Like, exactly. So are you saved? Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior? Or your Savior and your Lord? No, I don't, I don't, I'm not a church person. I'm not religious. Well, you just said you can't swim in the lake of fire. At some point, this whole world is going to be turned into a lake of fire. And unless you can swim in the lake of fire, there's no way you're going to be able to survive what's ultimately going to happen. So sin is what separates us from God. Sin is what has us on the path of eternal destruction. James 4, 17 says, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him is a sin. 
So sin is simply de defined as when you when you when you have a conscious mind to know that to do something wrong is wrong and you still do it. It's a sin to you. It's just that simple. We ain't gonna complicate the issue. This is an ink pen. If I was to go somewhere and to borrow this ink pen from somebody and to use it, and it's their ink pen, I know it's their ink pen. I asked them to use this ink pen, and I accidentally take this ink pen. And I find myself home later on. I say, "Oh man, I stole their ink pen unknowingly, even." I, that stealing is, is, is against the commandments. Thou shalt not steal. <laughs> I stole their ink pen. And I knew in my conscious mind, this is not my ink pen. And I took it. So in my mind, I know it's wrong. I know it belonged to them. And it may have been an innocent act, meaning that I didn't mean to steal it. But the fact is, I stole their ink pen. So he didn't know if to do good and do it not to him as a sin. So I can return this ink pen and say, oh man, I took your ink pen by accident. Here you go, man, my fault. And you know, I could be released from that. But for the most part, the Bible makes it clear that therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is a sin. Now I can get deep. Folks that's, that's sleeping with women they ain't married to, uh, people who, who, who married to one people, sleeping with some other people. I can get deep in sin, man with man, women with women. We can go on all day what sin is, but the Bible makes it clear. Who defines what's good? Jesus said, uh, why cost thou me good? Ain't nobody good but God. So God defines good. The only person that could define good is the person that is good. So since God defines good, what does he say that's good and what does he say that's bad? The Bible from Genesis to Revelation, he will explain to you what's good. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, when you know to do good and do it not, to him it is a sin. What else is a sin? When God commands you to do something and you don't do it. It's just, it can be that simple. Don't go in there and you go in there. You just committed a sin. What does sin do? Sin separates you from God. What do you mean it separates? It makes your, your hearing dull so you can't hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Sin also causes blindness where you can't prophetically see the things that God desires for you to see so you can do what he's called you to do. That's what sin does. Sin separates you from the, the glorious presence of God. It separates you from that peace that surpasses all understanding. It just separates you from understanding how it is you have to love your enemies and, and how you're supposed to treat those people right who despitefully are using you. It's, it, sin separates you from all the virtues, all the benefits, all the promises that God has given us. That's what sin does. And ultimately, the Bible makes it clear that sin will separate us from, 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 from God for eternity. I looked at it like this when I was a young person in church. I used to just imagine and vision things as the preacher was preaching. I would have these visions of what the preacher was talking about in my head. I'm an art, art, artist. By, I know how to draw, in other words. And so I, for, for me... To see a blank canvas, I wouldn't see a blank canvas, I would see what it could be. So when the preacher was preaching on sin one day, I was just sitting there meditating on the fact that it's like a person having on a, a, a black or white suit. Let's say just white suit, and somebody taking a loose little dot on it. And so they commit a sin, they throw a dot, they throw a black dot on a white suit, so it has a dot on it. And they're like, you know, let me wipe that off. Okay, they, some, then they get four or five dots on it. And they're like, after a while, they get so many dots, and these dots are representing sin and things they allow to happen in our life. And after a while, that white suit is not white no more. It's black. It's no longer what God had created you to be. And so far, your light can't shine when it's full of sin because people don't see you as the person God had created you to be. They see you as, once again, this untoward generation. A person that's full of sin is trying to fit into a world that we was never created to be a part of. We're in the world. We're not of the world. But because you want to fit in with your peers, because you got to present yourself being so prideful that we can't be saved because, therefore, him to know to do good and do of not to him it is a sin we have allowed sin nature to take over who we're supposed to be and it happens to so many and it's so sad and i hate to even make this point but it's a true fact that's why i don't look at church as a place where holy people assemble separated people assemble no more it's supposed to be a rehabilitation center a spiritual rehabilitation that's where people come in broken and they're made whole through a process of submitting to the word of the living god as you submit to the word of God, even all the way up to the preacher, the bishop, or whoever that man is up in front, we're all in a state of rehabilitation, reconciling ourselves to God. Ain't nobody arrived. Ain't nobody apprehended. We're all in this process together, learning these things, walking out our salvation with fear and trembling, trying to draw closer to God. So once again, James 4.17 says, Therefore, to him, in case you want to know what sin is or the definition, the biblical definition of sin, James 4, 17, therefore to him, or her, generically speaking him in the Bible, that him that knoweth to do good. So when you know with your conscious mind 
what is good, what is right, and you choose not to do it, and do if it not to him, it's a sin. Whatever it is, it is you doing. So we need to be we need to be saved from ourselves. So that's question number two, part two of two, because two had two parts. Number one, why we need to be saved was found in Romans five. If you're just now tuning in, you have to go back and play it again once I'm done. Number two was what do we need saved from? We need saved first from ourselves, and then we need saved from the wrath of God. Two things we need to be saved from. Because the wrath of God has not came yet, so there's still time for you to get right before that. But right now, we need to be saved from ourselves, our own stinking thinking, things that will separate us from God. And this is the way I, I've come to realize and recognize what it is. Um, I didn't used to know when I was a child why I was I got beaten or paddled. You know, as a child, you feel like, you know, well, yeah, I was playing. You know, I didn't mean to break the lamp, and you get a beating because you was told not to play in the house. So as a child, you don't necessarily understand why you got a weapon for playing. And it's not that you got a weapon for playing, you got a weapon for being disobedient. So as we grow up, God still chastises us because those he loves, he chastises. So as we grow up and we go through things and we experience things, people say, well, I don't know why I'm going through this. Well, God is chastising you. For some reason, we don't like to admit that. We don't like to admit that God is dealing with us to help correct us so we can have the things that we've been on our knees praying for. We don't like to admit that. We don't like to admit that God is chastising us. We think that this is open season on us, like the, the devil could just run in and do what he want to do. I was sharing with my uncle yesterday how people was like, I rebuke the devil in the name of Jesus. Let me help you understand what the devil is employed by. The devil works for the Lord. He can only do what God will allow him to do. He can't just come into your life and just start whooping you upside your head. If you believe that, read Job. The devil has to get permission before he can do anything to you. And God will allow him to only go so far. And what God is ultimately trying to do is, just like when you as a child, help you understand the things that you need to understand so God can bring you to the place that you've prayed to be to. The purpose and reason why you were created. So let me help you understand when negative things or bad things, so-called bad things happen in your life, what God is trying to do is get your attention so you can understand what he's trying to get you to understand to take you to the place where you desire to go to receive the things that you have prayed for. In other words, you can't say, well, Lord, give me this, give me that, and boom, it happens. No, you need to understand why it is God allows us to experience things for his glory. With, all, with, with everything that you're getting, get an understanding. I tell people, you, you, have, you have to get understanding. Faith cometh by hearing, so faith cometh. You can pray and ask for wisdom, and God gives it liberally. But in order to get understanding, you have to get it. How do you get understanding? You study to show yourself approved of workmen that need it not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So you literally have to physically take your faith and get understanding. In other words, when I'm going through something, instead of, oh Lord, I don't know why I'm going, you get in the book and you get on your knees and you pray and seek God. So we need to be saved, number two, from ourselves and from the wrath of God. Number one, why we need saved? We need to be saved because Adam messed up way long time ago in Genesis and messed it up for everybody. Therefore, we need a Savior. And that Savior came in the form and the person of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Number three, finally, which is number three, our final uh, question of, of who wants to be saved. Number three is how to be saved. Now I'm going to tell you how to be saved. I'm not going to leave you hanging. There may be some